Uh, thank you, Martin, for that introduction. And actually, you've made me think back when you mentioned that the last time we had this conference was in February 2020. I think I had been uh, care minister for around 10 days at that point, and uh, uh, how much has happened since then. But good morning, everyone, uh, this morning, and it is wonderful to be in a room together with you. And as I look around this room, I wonder how many of us will live to a hundred? Actually, probably quite a lot of us. And how many of us will, when we're a hundred, still be living in our own home with our own front door, still be cooking our own meals, doing our own washing and ironing, although maybe some of you don't actually do that now, still partial to a bit of gardening or a walk in the countryside, or spending the mornings reading what my grandmother would call an improving book. Now, I mentioned my grandmother for a reason, because actually I've been describing the way she lived when she reached 100 a few years ago. She was frustrated that her family wouldn't let her drive anymore. But other than that, and a bit of forgetfulness, she was doing incredibly well until she slipped on a damp paving stone and bruised her leg. Now, I'll spare you the details of what happened next, but she ended up in her local hospital where she then spent five months, occasionally receiving treatment, but mostly waiting for discharge. And you'll not be surprised to know that when she left there after five months, she was bed bound. And she died two weeks after returning home. I don't know why it proved so hard to get her out of hospital. I recollect social care being mentioned many times. But I do know it was terrible for her, those five months, and it filled up a hospital bed that should have been used for someone else. And I know it's a story that in one way or another is repeated across the country, has been for many years, and continues to be. Most MPs are motivated by the desire to make things better for their constituents. But there's nothing quite like a personal experience to give you the edge when it comes to determination to sort something out. A personal experience that means that when your head says, leave this problem to someone else, you instead follow your heart and say, I'll do this. So that's one reason why I'm here today as minister, not only for social care, but also for community health, integrated care, and also, in fact, fixing discharge. And I'm going to talk about what we're doing to fix discharge, keep people out of hospital in the first place, join up our health and social care systems and reform social care itself. And actually, in the moment when we have the panel section, session after, I'd also be delighted to hear some suggestions from people on these problems, because I recognise that many of the people here in the room have vast expertise, experience and insight into some of these problems and better still, how we can solve them. This winter has been one of the hardest for the NHS any of us can remember. Still experiencing the aftermath of the pandemic, indeed still with some patients in hospital with COVID, working to catch up the backlogs, looking after patients with flu, while at the same time many staff have been absent thanks to the worst flu season for a decade, and looking after a population where people are living longer with multiple health conditions and ever greater frailty. The consequences of that have included exceptionally busy emergency departments, fuller than normal hospitals, and many more patients in hospital beds when they should have been discharged home. At times, we've seen over 14,000 hospital beds, it's around one in seven, occupied by patients who have been declared medically fit for discharge. Beds that could be used for other people needing treatment, beds that are needed to help keep flow out of A&E, but also, crucially, beds occupied by patients who would be better off at home or in residential care with the right support to recuperate, rather than hospital, where we know not only may recovery be slower, but like my grandmother, they may in fact become frailer. Getting down ambulance weights, restoring flow through A&Es and hospitals, and getting patients home has been one of our highest priorities in the Department of Health and Social Care this winter, funded by our 500 million adult social care discharge fund, and then the 200 million step down care fund. 
and we have turned a corner. Any weights are down, ambulance weights are down, discharges into social care are up. Though beds occupied by patients fit for discharge have stayed frustratingly high, a topic indeed I'd welcome insights from this room. And I do know that not everyone is happy with the approach we've taken. I've heard the calls for longer term funding, concerns that there's been too much emphasis on residential care, especially in the second tranche of funding, and the need to support admissions avoidance along with discharges. That's why we'll soon be allocating the 600 million discharge funding for this coming financial year. And I've heard from the social care sector that there's been too much emphasis on the social care side of the problem and not enough on hospitals and their processes. Something I hope you saw recognised in the Urgent and Emergency Care Recovery Plan we published last month. A plan that builds on the work we've been doing this winter but goes further, boosting capacity with more beds, more ambulances, more staff and more social care. But also, crucially, a plan that is about doing things differently. Again, building on what's been working, for instance, scaling up short-term intermediate or step-down care to support people's recovery and reablement out of hospital. Scaling up virtual wards that have been already so successful in helping people be discharged early, even if just by a few days, meaning that patients can still have the support of the specialist hospital team while recovering in their own home. And providing more community-based care, more consistently across the country, like falls response services and frailty services, which we know reduce unnecessary admissions, particularly admissions of older people who are so at risk of becoming then those delayed discharges. Because we know caring for people better at home is the best answer for so many who are frail and elderly. The answer I wish had been there for my grandmother. By next winter, I want us to be in a much better place. With our health and care system keeping people out of hospital who don't need to be there, and those who do spend in hospital, time in hospital leaving when they are ready. I want local authorities to have forecasted the capacity needed across domiciliary, residential and nursing care in their areas, and to have commissioned in advance the amount of care their residents will need. So care providers can build up their workforces ready for the extra demands of winter. I want this to have been done jointly with the NHS in place or integrated care system footprints. So along with social care capacity, systems will know how much intermediate care and reablement they are going to need. And again, we'll have commissioned that. And I want joint health and social care discharge hubs in every hospital and joint control centres bringing health and social care data together to inform daily conversations about patients getting nearer to their discharge date, along with those virtual wards, comprehensive frailty services, falls response services, and scaled up step-down care. Now, I know that's a lot to ask for, but I make no apologies. Most systems have some of that going on already. The ambition here is to spread it out and scale it up. And while I'm under no illusions that we will always and rightly have local differences and diversity across our health and care system, where we know something works, Let's make sure it's part of the system wherever you live. This is backed by funding and backed with support from the centre, with expert teams like our National Discard Task Force, led by Leslie Watts and James Bullion, who travel the country helping systems understand what's holding them back and helping them make the changes we see in those doing well. Now, Leslie is Chief Executive of Chelsea and Westminster NHS Trust, and James is Director of Adult Social Services in Norfolk. They are a joint health and social care team, not by accident, but because achieving this ambition depends on truly joining up health and social care. And this is where integrated care systems come in. It's early days for most integrated care systems and their boards and partnerships. Some are more established, but in others, the relationships and ways of working are still forming. Now, I've been asked to be patient and give them time. Um, patience is not actually something that comes to me naturally. Uh, I'm trying, I can't guarantee it. But because people have been talking for so long about integration. Now, there may never be a perfect way 
But I have been told time and again over the last few months from people involved in ICBs and ICPs that this feels like the best shot we've ever had. That this time it does feel different. That people really are coming together and joining up. And I'll say to you that if you leave today thinking one thing, let it be this. As our system faces so many pressures, now is the time to put aside the differences between one organisation and another, between NHS organisations and social care, between NHS organisations themselves, to put aside the different agendas and priorities and look at the whole needs of the whole population in each part of the country, to put aside the differences and think and act as one, as one single joined up health and social care system. And now I will talk about social care reform. Not the charging reforms, which are incredibly important, but everyone knows are delayed to 2025, but the system reforms. The reforms, in fact, that the sector, local authorities, care providers, representatives of people who draw on care and support and carers really want, the reforms that we in government have been working on, in fact, have already started and are going full steam ahead with. The care workforce is our social care system's greatest asset, with around 1.5 million people across the country. But even at that scale, it's not enough. We need more care workers. We are getting more care workers. Many of you may have seen our Made in Care advertising campaign and we're seeing really strong international recruitment since care workers were added to the shortage occupation list. Care providers have told me that international recruitment is really making a difference for their ability to meet the need for care. And we can see that in the numbers, with over 50,000 visas offered to people over the last year to take up care worker roles. This is essential for the here and now, but in government we're also looking ahead. And care workers are at the forefront of our social care reforms. Working in care can be hugely rewarding. And I've spoken to care workers who've told me how they love their jobs, but they've also told me how they don't feel they're appreciated for what they do and how hard it is to gain skills or for those skills to count. We need to recognise care workers for the skilled professionals that they are. And we are going to put in place the structures that will underpin that, giving care workers the opportunity to develop their skills and be recognised for them. It's something that happens in the best care providers, but not for everyone. And it's something that's happened in the pandemic in some specific places. For instance, in Lincolnshire, where care workers have been trained up to take on nursing tasks. Now, just as your report Nuffield Trust, and Nuffield Trust found, care workers who receive relevant high quality training are more likely to stay, feel confident and be able to deliver personalised high quality care. So we're going to be introducing some of the building blocks to support staff to gain skills and recognition for that clearly and consistently across the country. As I said, putting the care workforce at the heart of our reforms. But there's more. Some years ago, I played a part in creating more transparency in healthcare. So that now we have a wealth of data to inform us on what is going on in our hospitals. But one of the things that I encountered when I first became care minister was how little we knew about what was going on in social care. Now that has already changed with the tool we call the capacity tracker, which we developed during the pandemic to gather information from the front line. But I know we can do better than that. That's why starting in April, we're going to collect data about the care that people receive across all local authorities. It's known as the client level data set. And we're introducing CQC assurance of local authorities delivery of the Care Act because local authorities play a really important part in the care system. And I want those who do really well to get the recognition that they deserve. While those who are doing less well should be able to learn from the best because the care you get should not depend on what part of the country you call home. And because the more people know about social care, the better it will be. Finally, I cannot talk about social care without mentioning carers. 
because for the vast majority of people, care begins at home with their families or friends, people on whom much of the stress and strain of caring can fall. That's why our white paper, People at the Heart of Care, included 25 million to help identify the support needed for unpaid carers, so that they have the time and support to live independent and fulfilling lives too. And this spring, I will be publishing a plan which will set out the next steps for these and wider system reforms. To close, let me return to where I started, to my grandmother. For a hundred years, she lived an incredible life and an incredibly healthy life. But in those last five months, our health and social care system failed her, as it still does for too many people and as it has done for too many years. But I often say to myself when I come across things that are hard to solve, if not now, when? We know what we need to do and we know it's the right thing. The right thing for our system, the right thing for the staff who work in health and social care, and most importantly, the right thing for all those people and their families who trust our health and social care system to be there for them and to look after them in their hour of need. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Do come and join me. And I'd like to invite uh, Natasha, Vic and Sarah to come and join us on the platform as well. Thank you so much. You see yourself down. Okay, so um, so welcome to our panel, an opportunity to discuss um, some of the successes and many of the challenges uh, that we're experiencing in providing social care. Um, Helen's already been introduced. Um, <coughs> I'd like to also introduce uh, Sarah Pickup, who's Deputy Chief Exec of uh, ADAS and a Nuffield Trustee. Local Government Association. Local Government Association. No, I'm sorry. There you go. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, Vic Rayner, Chief Exec of the National Care Forum, and Natasha Curry, uh, Deputy Director of Policy uh, for the Trust. So welcome. Uh, thank you very much for joining us. So um, I'm going to start off with a question and then going to open up. So do um, have a think about the questions that you'd like to ask of the panel. Um, it's a big question, notwithstanding the successes that you've been describing, Helen. It seems to me that trying to achieve reform of the social care system in the UK has been incredibly difficult, probably more difficult than, than I think some other countries have experienced from the work that the Nuffield Trust ha has done. So um, in the last 15 years, we've had a Royal Commission in 1999, uh, the Oneness Review in 2006, a white paper in 2010, the Dillnot Review in 2011, um, the CARE Act in 2014. We've had numerous green papers, white papers, um, health select committee reviews. Um, and yet, um, where are we? Um, we're still struggling, it seems to me. Why is it so difficult? And I'm going to give Helen a little break for a second and I'm going to turn to <laughs> Natasha first. Why is it so difficult to achieve um, radical, substantive change in social care policy? Mm. Well, as you've outlined, we've had sort of two decades of proposals and, their, and promises and then a, a failure to then uh, bring about any tangible change or much tangible change. And I think when we sort of unpick some of the factors that are at play here and we look at other countries, so we've studied a number of other countries in detail about how they've managed to bring about change. And I think there are a number of elements that we've seen there that we haven't necessarily seen here. So in the two countries I've studied in depth, Germany and Japan, what we saw was a groundswell of public support and a real strong understanding of what social care is. And I think that's one of the issues we still face here. So upwards of 40% of people think that social care is funded by the NHS. So there's a lack of awareness, I think. Um, we saw um, strong political cooperation and leadership in the other countries, um, which I think helped to, to um, negotiate um, and bring about change. And then I think what a really fundamental point is that the other country we looked at situated the debate in not in sort of individual costs and, and, and thinking of social care as a cost, but about its role in the wider social and economic infrastructure. Um, and in both the countries I've looked at, social care was a, a, seen as a key piece of infrastructure that enables the economy and society to function. And I think there's a bit of a, a, a difference here where we, we start the debate 
um, talking about who pays and cost. So I think there's, there's a few, few issues there that sort of explain possibly why this is so, has been so difficult here. That's great. Thank you. Sarah? Thanks very much. Well, um, in a way, I think uh, why it's so hard is it gets harder the longer we go on. Um, it's a bit of a moving target, isn't it? Because there's rising demand um, in social care, both in terms of um, older people, but also the rising number of people with disabilities, which is a really big part of the cost of delivering social care and, a, and actually imp impacts on someone's life throughout their life, not just a, at a point in time. Um, and there's also changing expectations. So some of the really valid legislation around things like autism um, and wanting to support people into employment and to live um, independent lives change the expectation of social care and yet we still got an eligibility driven system where we have to do the things above the line and therefore we struggle to invest in the things below the line. I think inevitably austerity didn't help um, because councils had to cut their spending across the board. Uh, a lot of their spending is on social care and a lot of their spending is in the independent sector um, and so fees were depressed because councils had to balance their books um, and we're kind of living with the consequences of that and it went on for quite a long time um, and so that's been a challenge. The nature and size of the market is also and the diversity of it is really um, challenging as well. So how do you kind of change the way a workforce um, is paid, the terms and conditions when you've got a huge number of independent, voluntary, private workforce? Is it or isn't it the job of the government to do that? And that is a point of debate that I know different governments have had. Um, there's a range of different challenges from who pays, so the charging thing, right through to how do you help someone with a disability live a good life. And somewhere in the middle, there's hospital discharge and prevention of admission. And all of that is social care. So it's really big. The cost makes it hard. It needs a really big injection of funding uh, to do it. If that national insurance rise that was and then wasn't had gone through, and if it had all been for social care, that would have been in the territory of what's needed, I think, to help really get underneath this challenge because it's not just about changing what we do it's about paying for what we need to deliver for people paying for the actual care that people get every day um, and then finally just a recognition that um, we talk a lot about social care impacting on the nhs and doing the right thing the nhs impacts on social care as well um, whether you get the right therapeutic, therapeutic support after a stroke whether your incontinence is treated whether you can access community nursing and therapies all influence how much, whether you need social care and how, you know, the level you need and how long you need it for. Tremendous. Vic. Okay, uh, so um, just to add to some of those things, I, I guess I think there's the, the starting point would be uh, around the view of social care as a public service, I think to echo some of um, kind of Natasha's points around that. And I, and I think in order to do that, we need to recognise that not only do we just need to say the words, we need to put the kind of infrastructure and support around that in the same way as we have for health and education. And we need to recognise where we think when we're thinking about new bodies like ICSs, we need to have social care provision right at the heart of those discussions and decision making. And I would certainly argue that many of the challenges we face around discharge uh, and around um, uh, people leaving the hospital or, or entering the hospital unnecessarily are because we don't have uh, that voice of provision right at the heart of that kind of decision making. And I think what, you know, I, I think we certainly have a position now, uh, you mentioned 15 years of kind of papers and, and discussion. So 15 years ago, 2008, uh, the government at the time removed the ring fence uh, around supporting people funding, funding that was enabling people to live independently, was a properly focused prevention uh, funding uh, stream. And the removal of that means that people who are now coming to social care are so unsupported uh, and so challenged in many aspects of their life that they're in a, in a point of crisis that means that the only response is a very acute um, response. So we've, we've, we've lost the understanding of how important prevention is in communities and that means that we have a massive cost. I think the two other points I would make is that in the context of the kind of financial challenges that everybody is facing. I work, with, I, I work only in the not-for-profit sector and I think we have to think really strategically about how we commission the social care of the future and think about how much more 
of a role not-for-profit provision could play there, and I'd be really interested to have that discussion with people over these two days, because I think it's a fundam It's happening in Wales in, in relation to children's commissioning of social care services, that they will all be filtered through not-for-profit organisations rather than um, independent private private organisations. So I think we should have that debate here. And finally, um, then with the... Ab it, it, not taking aside the fantastic work Natasha and others have done around international focus, we see social care as a UK or indeed an England only challenge. We do not look across the globe. This is a global issue. And, and I imagine many of you as health practitioners could not imagine trying to challenge new and emerging health problems without looking out to a global community to find out what the best practice is all over the world. We see it as, a, as an England-only problem. We see the solutions as England-only solutions. And yet we operate in a global market, certainly for workforce, and we should be thinking about a global, uh, a global kind of... Um, coalition of ideas around how we make social care the kind of social care that people want. We've got 750 million people who are over 65 in 2019. We will have one and a half billion across the globe in 2050. That's only 27 years away and we can't manage the social care we need now. Uh, so we've got to think radically, think differently and, and I think, think, you know, start to stop you know, net zero is clearly a, a powerful and uh, important driver, but sort of zero ageism uh, and, and zero uh, attitude towards disability, um, uh, prejudice around disability would be the, the things that we need to be thinking about right now. And just to clarify, uh, Natasha or Vic, which are the countries we should be looking at? Which countries are doing it well? Well, we've looked at Germany and Japan as two examples with very rapidly aging populations and their systems are not perfect, but they have a lot of learning. I think Denmark and the Netherlands are two that we should be looking to as well. And the, the other Scandinavian countries are yeah, quite interesting def too. Definitely okay. the other Scandinavian okay. countries yeah. around this and around homelessness and all sorts of other agendas. Yeah, and Brilliant. I think the uh, Every Australian Matters um, yeah. mm -hmm. campaign about getting the public awareness raised was really important around disability. There's a fair amount we can learn. So, <laughs> Helen, you, you understandably presented a a positive view of what you're doing now. Um, we've heard some, I don't know whether scepticism is the right word, but certainly some, some significant challenges from other three members of the panel. Where, where are you on why this has apparently been so difficult historically for us? Oh, I mean, listening to uh, your panel, um, a, a moment ago I said that I think that a lot of, you know, lots of answers and insights are in the room and you know, fantastic insights from just three people uh, in the room. So you know, I look forward to what will come out of the conversation of the next uh, couple of days here. Um, but to pick up, uh, particularly actually on, on one of the first things that Nas Natasha said, which reflects one of the things I think about the challenge in achieving social care reform, is to do actually with everybody's understanding of our social care system and what social care is. Now, I know my speech was a lot about social care and care for older people. Um, but of course, as I think Sarah just mentioned, we know that people of working age with disabilities, actually about half of a local authority social care budget is supporting people of working age uh, with, with disabilities uh, in social care. Uh, while yes, a lot of the conversation, to the extent we have it, is usually about the needs of older people. Um, but also it's just you know, broadly about us as a society and here, Vic, I'm, yes, I am talking about England because that's the, uh, my, my remit as, uh, uh, as a minister. Um, it's, as a society, understanding you know, what social care is, what it involves, how it's funded, how you get it. And quite often, people don't even think about it until either they need it for themselves or they need it for a family member. I've had so many conversations with people where they just had no idea what was going to come their way until... Know, their mum or their dad or somebody, for instance, um, you know, began to get dementia and needed care, and then suddenly they discovered about social care. So I think, mm. and, and as I said um, uh, in my speech, we don't have nearly as much data and information about social care, about you know, what is doing, who's being looked after, uh, what's good, where's good, than we do <laughs> in healthcare. So to me, a really important part of now, being able to really drive uh, reform, and it's not, not something that's not going to happen overnight, it, it's a, a long journey, um, is having much more data, information and broader understanding about social care. Really helpful. Let's open up for 
questions. Uh, we've got a question down here in the front. Uh, Sam, please give your uh, name and where you're from. Sam. Uh, Sam Everington, GP in Tower Hamlets. I could see, Helen, that um, the story of your grandmother, uh, the five months story, really moves you and moves you to make change. So we're doing something in Tower Hamlets. We've done it for 10 years, a local contract with the ICB, which proactively manages situations like your grandmother, 5% uh, of our practice population. It would be the equivalent of 2 million across the country. I call it a virtual ward, but based in the community, not a virtual ward based in the hospital. Yeah. That proactive management keeps people out of hospital, gets them out quickly, and most importantly, helps people die at home surrounded by their loved ones. 47% of this country are still dying in hospital with terminal illness. Okay? And finally, I just wanted to give you one example of what does this actually mean in, in reality? Well, just in the last three months, I've managed three patients personally at home with terminal illness, not going into hospital, the last one seeing the night before she died, talking to the relatives about what death looks like um, and what to do. They text me at 6.30 in the morning. I was around that quarter, to, uh, quarter past seven, did the death certificate, Muslim family, buried their mother that day. That's what's possible with a virtual ward in the community and a contract that we in Tower Hamlets and City in Hackney have with our ICB 10 million pound contract, we do lots of other things too. So my offer to you is actually <coughs> to get all the ICBs to do that across the country because I think you would be solving your grandmother's problem that way. So providing care in the community is good for the individual and it's good for hospitals and good for care homes as well. And yet we know that you need to have robust services available in the community. And Natasha, some of your work has suggested that isn't the case, is that right? Um, yeah, I think that's a really interesting example, and I think that over, over time there have been some really um, positive, interesting, innovative examples of how this can work, but it's not scaled up, and I think there is the, some things in our evaluative work that we've found that are really key to making things like that work. So working across systems re requires trust and relationships, um, and they often take a long time to build up and system changes and re, um, reconfigurations can interrupt that. There also needs to be, I think, a longer term investment so that areas have enough um, funding to be able to plan ahead and think strategically. And I think what Helen was talking about, the potential of ICBs to do that um, is there. But I think at the moment, one of the fundamental problems is that social care is not an equal partner around the ICB table and that's partly because of the funding model but also because those historic relationships are, are not there um, and while we've seen the injection of money towards discharge recently it's short term and it takes a long time to build up the relationships and to make decisions strategically over long term so I think yeah there are pockets of examples but how we scale it up I think needs to be given some thoughts. So we'll be coming back to the role of ICPs. Um, more questions? Got a question over there in the middle? Stephen Dorrell, can I first of all congratulate Nuffield Trust on having the opening session on social care and integrated care and also uh, congratulate Helen on her speech which I thought was very compelling. What my point is to ask that we don't diminish the concept of integrated care by thinking it's just about the National Health Service and social care. For example, how can you do integrated care for children and not, in, uh, and not involve the schools? How can you do integrated care for elderly people and not involve the housing department? And slightly more controversially, when a local, uh, a local authority closes a library service, what it's doing is removing a meeting place within the community, yeah. which creates all kinds of further demands uh, further down the system. So my appeal would be that this is not just the NHS and social care. This is the NHS and local public services in the fullest expression of that uh, represented by local government. And that's the challenge, it seems to me, for the NHS to make space in the ICS for all local, gov uh, local government services, recognising that there are linkages between all of them. 
And that's what ICSC should be doing, but they seem to be spending a lot of their time performance managing. All right? No. I don't think I need the microphone. Yes. <laughs> okay, great. Let's take another question before we come back to the panel. Uh, Jane in the middle here, sorry. You want to stand up, Jane, and then um, we can see you. There you go. Thank you. Um, so, so I want to talk about workforce because I think the biggest problem underlining a lot of this is to do with workforce and, and then getting onto my niche little hobby horse about workforce is that the majority of the social care workforce is female. But how do they stay at work without the support that they need? Because uh, I was sitting outside just a little while ago now talking to my daughter who's trying to get her children to school and who can't find childcare, who can't afford childcare. So the issues that the female workforce have or are understated, are underrecognized, and if we put an enormous effort into supporting women back into work at all stages, at all career stages, because they are the majority of people that are caring for people in social care, and we don't recognize it and we don't support it. And if we did, it would make a huge impact not only on those women who want to go to work, but also on the people that need to be cared for by them. So, support the women, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much indeed. Let's, let's turn back to the panel and, and, um, and address the ICBICS um, challenge. Comments? Sarah? Um, yeah, thanks. So, um, I think uh, what was mentioned earlier about ICS is potentially being, you know, an opportunity which is, you know, better than some of the opportunities we've had before. I've sat in a lot of the discussions from a local government perspective about the development of ICSs. Um, the local government association pushed for the separate partnership arrangement, the integrated care partnership, because we felt that an NHS statutory body couldn't be the vehicle for partnership because it would never be on an equal footing. So the, so, so the IC integrated care partnership um, and the Integrated Care Board often have local government chief executives on them who represent the full breadth of services. Um, and the Integrated Care Partnerships are joint partnerships equally owned by local government and the NHS. And they can be whatever those partners want them to be. Um, and they can have whichever local government representatives on them and voluntary sector and social care provider representatives on them that people think will help deliver um, the objectives of ICS is in their area and the objectives are about population health, about reducing health inequalities and about actually health, not ill health. Um, and the integrated care boards are there. They are a, they, they, you know, they, we need a statutory body, don't we, to help um, manage the NHS at, at A level. And they have local government representation on them, but the vehicle for partnership is the integrated care partnerships. And just the other thing I would say about local government is um, when we talk about um, the need to invest in adult social care, the council is seeing it in that broad way. So it's no good cutting the library service or the public health budget to invest in adult social care, but councils have to balance their budget across the board. Um, and the demand is rising both in adult care, but also in children's services and housing and all the other areas of service. So we need to not see adult care in isolation of the rest of a council's <coughs> job and the rest of a council's budget. And the other thing local government can bring, um, and I think this is an offer the LGA made during some of the, our work on a green paper prior to your um, white paper, is that um, we can bring the political parties together and we, you know, we can offer to convene and have offered to convene uh, across the political spectrum for solutions to social care. Because one of the challenges, of course, is that as governments change, white papers come and go um, or have come and gone. Maybe it won't happen in the future. Um, but, I, you know, I think in many ways things have changed very positively. I sit in rooms and there's a much greater understanding of the connectivity between health and care and what integration, particularly at that prevention, Sam's end of the spectrum kind of level can deliver. But we're, we're not there yet. We're, we're on a, road, a long, very long road, it feels. Indeed. Helen, I know you need to leave for yeah. another commitment. So the ICS issue, do you think it's fair to say that ICSs are being distracted from the function that many of us were excited about, which is population focus, um, flexibility, partnership building, more strategic function, that they're what taking on the role yeah. of regional... NHS. I mean, one thing I'd say is that it's early days for uh, 
integrated care systems and uh, some were already more established uh, in well, the form of STPs and things before. Others are uh, still very much in the process of building relationships and who does what and, uh, and partnerships and making it work. And there's a diversity, and I've, I've talked to quite a lot of them, uh, you know, different places at different stages. Uh, that said, I would say in all of the calls that I've had and meetings I've had with integrated care systems, boards, partnerships within them, um, talking about the whole population and actually prevention and looking uh, sort of upstream at the health of the population has been emphasised by those from the uh, integrated care system saying you know, how important they think it is. And while I've sometimes, because it's been so top of my mind, been saying, well, you know, how are you getting on, on, on discharge? They've always come forward and said, let's make sure we do talk about prevention and population uh, mm -hmm. health as well. So I do think that uh, integrated care systems are really thinking uh, in that way. Um, as I said, it is, it is relatively early days and uh, there's Patricia Hewitt's review going on to you know, draw the early lessons about how we can support integrated care systems to fulfil their potential for this. And you, know, you give me the opportunity to reiterate before I go just what I said a moment ago at the lectern, which is there's no perfect way of achieving integration. It's been tried before in many ways, it's been talked about for decades, um, but I have heard from so many people involved in it that this time is better than before. And to Stephen's point, yes, it's about joining up uh, NHS organisations, local authorities, social care providers, the provider voice is really important in the room. Actually, also third sector organisations and patient representatives it really is, and, and it'll be different in different areas, but it's crucial about bringing together those different parts of our health and social care systems. And to, to borrow an analogy I heard from David Nicholson, uh, that stitching, and how you stitch organisations together really matters. The stitching matters in your, your jacket or what you're wearing. The stitching of all those parts of our system, the organisations, the conversations that happen, that really matters. It's something that's happening and it's something which you know, I'm determined in government to support happening at local level because that's how thinking as one health and social care system in the broadest possible way about the populations in the area, that's what we have to do to make things better. Okay. Brilliant. You're very well welcome to stay away. if you want to, but if you have to slip away, that's no, fine. Thank no you. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, you so much. Thank, thank you for thank coming. You. Um, Vic, you were, you were going to... Yes, yeah, uh, just, just to those two points, actually, br briefly. I mean, it, it's really uh, interesting to have that focus on ICBs and, and uh, Sarah's role at the point about the ICPs. I mean, I think, that, you know, you've said really clearly, Sarah, the... the the chief executive representative there from the local government is, is representing the whole of local government. They are not there as the social care representative solely. And I just think we need to say that loud and clear. And actually, I think it's nonsense to say it's at the behest of the ICP to determine whether social care provision is at the table or not. How can we be talking about integrated health and care provision without having social care provision as a mandatory role at that, at that table? And, and I, I just don't understand uh, what the prevarication is really in, in relation to that. The point about the workforce, just to come to that, we, I mean, the, we, unfortunately, the minister's gone now with a solution around the workforce is to pay the workforce more. We have, got a, we have got a situation where the system is eating itself. We have got health, the health service able to pay more money for health care assistance, for, for nursing roles, to offer better terms and conditions. And I am hearing from members again and again around the country, you know, the local trust has put out a, a plea for additional workers. Our staff are moving there. Yes, and they're going to Lidl and Audi and Pret-a-Manger put their salaries up. You know, we're competing in a market, but why? when we're trying to deliver the same thing, integrated health care, health and care, we are competing with each other. And the point about women, yes, it's an 82%, 84% women, 82% women in, in the social care sector. It's uh, poorly paid, part-time work, often not great terms and conditions. Well, you know, that is a disgrace. That's an absolute disgrace. And, uh, you know, the fact that we, we then, we've got an ageing uh, population as well. 25% of um, social care managers are 55 and over. We have got 
unless we do something about making it much more attractive for people of all ages, all genders, you know, all nationalities to come and work in social care, we're going to be really in big trouble. OK. Um, Chris, you had your hand up earlier, but I don't know whether it was for the minister. Well, I, I mean... I uh, Joe, we'll just wait for the uh, mic. Sorry, one second. If you could give your uh, name and... It's Chris Smith from the Times. I, I would have obviously been interested in the minister's answer to this, but interested in the other panellists too about workforce. The NHS is about to publish a workforce plan setting out how many staff it's going to need in, in the next decade and, and how much short it will be if it doesn't change what it do. If that's the right approach for the NHS, is that, should that also be the right approach for, for social care? Can I take yeah, that first? Please, I'm yeah. not sure the others can add. So, yeah, I think so. I don't think we've had um, a long-term workforce plan for social care since 2009. Um, we don't know. One of the fundamental issues here is we don't know who works in social care. You know, as Sarah set out, it's a hugely diverse, complex market of provision. But we don't have a good handle on, on who the staff are. We have no register. Um, so, but having a long-term plan would be really helpful and I think that's the starting point here and I think it was you know the, the government's plans around training and progression all very well but as Vic says if we don't back that up with pay then we're just back to square one I don't think we have we can have a credible strategy without a plan for for increasing pay for the workforce tremendous um we've got five minutes left um and I saw two hands over there um on the Table on the edge first. Yep, gentleman with a beard. Yeah, thanks. Hi, I'm Natalie Mogul. I'm a former medic in the NHS and then retired and failed to retire and then did some interesting things in the independent sector. And of course, tie my question brilliantly because the politicians left the room. Um, the examples set out where good social care and social services are set out internationally. Is there a question there about the democratic deficit in this country? fails to be truly representative of the people of the country to have their needs met. Because if you look at countries where there is true representative democracy, are decisions being made for the people rather than based on political dogma? Because in this nation we seem to have answers that are only potentially from one side or the other. And of course, no one party has the right answer. That would have been the question of the politician, of course. <laughs> <laughs> so you're advocating a Swedish model of um, local authority commissioned health and care services. Is that what you're? No, it's higher. It's higher. higher than that. Yeah. Okay. All right. Great. Steve. Uh, thanks very much, Steve Leitner, uh, GP and well, GP with a public health background. Um, can I bravely make a suggestion that we've thought about integrated care in the wrong way? We've thought about integrated care from a whole population perspective which has therefore taken us down the route of organisational integration. And I would suggest we think about integrated care in the way that Sam has alluded to, that integrated care isn't required by everybody, but it is really required by a very small proportion of the population. And universally, it is about 5% of the population with complex need who need a highly integrated, proactive, personalised uh, approach and therefore it would take us to thinking about virtual wards in the community and small teams working together not thinking about whole organizational integration and just finally just to put some numbers behind it some work from uh, HN who do predictive analytics and clinical health coaching their work in the Midlands showed that five percent of the population drive 70 percent of the occupied bed days and actually, that cohort is highly transient. So you look at that cohort the next year, and most of that cohort has changed. So we need systems that predict um, Helen's grandma. And if they haven't been predicted, they automatically become part of the model. But we need to think rather uh, than about whole population. We need to think about this very small cohort who needs something very different. And that's not about whole organizational integrations. Great, thank you very much. I'm going to take one more very quick question from the back of the room. Anybody? There are no hands at the back of the room. Okay, no, there is. Okay. At the back, there. So I'm um, Ben Collins from the South East London Integrated Care System. So um, my parents were also both in hospital 
um, over Christmas. And we engaged with the GP, with a rapid response team, with a community discharge team, with a social care team, and with cardiac nurses. And in Helen's uh, speech earlier, she mentioned at least another half dozen small teams, and they're all dealing with much the same groups of people, um, but they're all, and they're all doing much the same stuff, but one team will deal with this subgroup, another team will deal with that subgroup. One team can administer intravenous antibiotics, another team can't. Um, and, and I was just struck that we're very happy to talk about integration and joining things up, and then without noticing it, we rattle off this incredibly fragmented system, which I don't think it would need the most astonishing stitching, um, to, to Helen's point. So um, coming back to Sam's idea, isn't there a fundamental need for redesign, for um, you know, con fundamental consolidation of this system if we're ever going to live up to, to this promise of integrated care? Tremendous. Thank you very much. I'm going to come back to the panel um, and ask you an impossible question. 30 seconds each. <laughs> what, is the top, what is your top suggestion to the minister about what she needs to do to turn around the social care system in England? Natasha. Oh, me first. Um, <laughs> I think if I was to pick one burning priority, it's the workforce. I think, you know, without social care, without people, enough people, we don't have a social care system. The, you can talk about tech and data all you like, but actually it's about human relationships and stuff. So I think if we're to prioritise one issue, it's, it's to have that long-term strategy for the workforce to address pay, conditions, training, all the rest of it, to make sure that the social care workforce is on a, a stronger footing as the health workforce. Thank you. Vic? On the basis this is like my grandma went to market, I'll have that. <laughs> Plus, uh, I think we have to uh, re-understand the importance of prevention. We talk a lot about wanting people to live independently at home uh, for as long as they wish to in the way that they wish to, and yet we don't offer any support to them till they can't live independently at home in the way that they want to, in the way that they wish to. So let's get... Uh, let's live the CARE Act, let's talk prevention, let's invest in prevention and let's make a real difference to people's lives now, not later. Thank you very much indeed. And Sarah? And my grandmother bought all those things too, <laughs> um, but she also wanted to focus on recovery. Um, so prevention, invest in prevention, invest in recovery, it all requires investment in the workforce. But let's all go back to what are we here for to support individuals to live good lives. Um, and yes, integration is at system level, but the, what we really need to integrate is around the person. And it isn't just integration for the complex people. It's the integration at the preventative end to do, you know, because we need the GP data to know who might need the money advice or the support that will help them stay independent and not get lonely and that prevents their needs escalating. So prevention, recovery, workforce, and it's got to be funded. You've got to fund the actual services, not just the transformation of them. Not just a strategy, Not but a words. delivery. Mm. Mm -hmm. yeah. Indeed. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs> so thank you to Helen. Thank you to the panel for a very stimulating session. I suspect there are a number of issues raised which will uh, continue to run over the next couple of days. You've now got a good break. Uh, we purposely built in uh, time for networking, time for conversations. The next session starts at 11, I think. Have I got that right? No one's saying no. 11 o'clock, I think, for the next session. Enjoy it. <laughs> <laughs>